Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Whistleblower Heroes, everyday heroes and educators sharing the information that you need to know here on Revolution Radio, and I'm your host, Ella. Well, what is a whistleblower? A whistleblower is a person who makes public disclosures of wrongdoing, corruption, and crime. These courageous people often suffer retaliatory actions because of their disclosures. In the end, many of these people are often the catalysts for needed change and are eventually lauded as heroes. And I'm here to celebrate these wonderful heroes and give them a platform because shining a light on wrongdoing wherever it occurs plays an important role in keeping society peaceful, free, and just. So with me today, it's my pleasure to share with you a legend. He's an actor, an activist, a truther, and he's well known for his extensive charity work. Well, hello, Mr. Ed Asner, and welcome to the show. Nice to be with you. It's really, really, it's wonderful to have you here. I, I can't be more excited. So before we get started, I'd like to share more about Mr. Asner. He, again, is an actor, activist, voice actor, and former president of the Screen Actors Guild. He uh, he is primarily known for his role as Lou Grant during the 1970s and early 1980s on both the Mary Tyler Moore show and its spinoff series, Lou Grant, making him one of the few television actors to portray the same leading character in both a comedy and a drama. He's the most honored male performer in the history of the Primetime Emmy Awards, having won seven. In 2009, he starred as the voice of Carl Fredrickson's and Pixar's animated film Up and made a guest appearance on CSI New York. As in return to television as Butcher in Working Class, he starred in the Canadian television series Michael Tuesdays and Thursdays on CBS Television and has appeared in the 2013 television series The Glades and The Good wife and many many more he's been nominated for 47 awards and has won more than half of them he is even he even has a star in the walk of fame and has received the screen actors guild life achievement award and mr asner you have also done wonderful wonderful work as an activist so i'm very excited to get to that as well and it's an honor to be interviewing you today is there anything else you would like to correct or add before we get started no i think i i ought to just sneak out of town after reading that after hearing that glowing uh, uh, summation you've given of me, uh, I can't improve on that. <laughs> okay. I mean, my favorite part, of course, is your activism. It's more extensive and impressive, so we'll, we're going to cover that a little bit more during our interview. And I guess a good place to start is always the beginning. And when you were a child, did you imagine that you would have such an illustrious career as an adult? Was that something that you were – were you an ambitious child? Because uh, not only as an actor, as an activist, which is so impressive and so many people appreciate in you. Well, I, I identified a lot with history. Uh, I gloried in the heroes of history and in the, the sagas of history. Uh, I never thought I'd be one, but it certainly uh, uh, whets your appetite to uh, uh, be identified that way later on. Uh, even though uh, courage has never been one of my uh, uh, leading ingredients. Did you grow up, is, is it, am I correct to say you grew up in Chicago and you actually served in the military as well prior to your careers? Yeah, well, I, I did serve in the military. Now, I started in Kansas City. Kansas City, Kansas. Oh, okay. I Thanks went to the in Chicago, which established me in Chicago, where I began to act. I see. Okay. And then um, eventually you made it to Los Angeles. What year was that? 61. 51. Okay. So you've been doing this a long time. 51. And how did it come about this, you know, you played this role in Mary Tyler Moore show. How did that come about? Auditioning. Just auditioning. Uh, I had been a character actor in the business for some time before that, mm -hmm. both in New York and here. And uh, I was just very fortunate to be recommended and to uh, achieve placement with my audition. Mm -hmm. And another role that means a lot to me on a personal note is that you were also in the miniseries Roots. Yep. Well, I had established myself with miniseries before that, 
with Rich Man, Poor Man, which I loved doing. Mm. Uh, then Roots came along, and I was delighted and surprised that they still wanted me. <laughs> but they did. I see. So, so when did activism become of your, a part of your life? What was, um, what drew you into activism? What caught your interest? What drew me into activism? Yes. Was there a particular topic that well, because really it's traumatic. you? I'm sorry. Activism automatically implies an underdog. Uh, uh, a persecuted element, uh, and you uh, identify with it and seek to succor it mm -hmm. or succor it, however you pronounce the word, uh, to rectify the wrongs done to a minority somewhere. Mm-hmm. And, and what Armenians in Turkey mm -hmm. uh, after World War One or during World War One, being Jews in Germany, being blacks in the United States and Latinos, and Chinese. Um, there's always somebody who's getting the short stick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Agreed. What did you see as a child that seemed to kind of, um, what's the word, kind of create that concern for you? Was there anything in particular? Well, I'm a Jew. Mm-hmm. And I was born in 1929, so I was a tasty morsel at the time of Hitler. Uh, we knew very little about Hitler in the United States until uh, victory was achieved in 45. But uh, I probably would have been barbecued had I been uh, in Europe yeah, at the time of Hitler. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was quite... Uh quite something that's that's a piece of history that will remain with us for forever and I don't think that will ever die down as something that was horrendous and atrocious and it's going on now in various other places we we saw what happened to the the uh, Tutsis mm -hmm. in the uh, in Rwanda mm -hmm. we, uh, we saw what happened to the Muslims uh, in Burma, M Myanmar, as it was formerly called, uh, the, it, it, uh, it's very easy to find a, uh, a group of people who are the minority that nobody else knows about or cares about. I'd say so, and and I, I imagine with your status and the fact that you were a celebrity, that was a great opportunity for you to use your platform as a way to reach people on whatever it was that you're concerned about. There's so many things too. Yeah, uh, which which brought me into the Central American crisis, mm -hmm. and the fact that the uh, the, the depredators, the evildoers in Latin America were uh, all being trained at the uh, School of the Americas by the United States, uh, taught the uh, efficient and clever and quick ways of getting rid of people, and it was used as an anti-communist tool to uh, depress the uh, rebellious peasants in El Salvador and Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know I'm I'm on the younger side, so I'm not very familiar with this 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 other atrocity we're speaking of. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. it it. it it went all around Latin America, Argentina for a while, Chile, Uruguay. Uh, we've uh, we we've done our soiling our hands in our anti-communist uh, 
uh, pursuit uh, and enforcing our sphere of influence in South America by making it a an east-west conflict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did that end up? How did what end up? You know, this this plight that was going on there. What were what were the changes that were made to kind of uh, kind of stop this atrocity? Uh, I don't know that it's ever stopped. Not completely. Yeah, we just don't hear that much about it. At least I don't. My own but... personal case. My show was canceled. Mm. But. Um, uh, and eventually, uh, you run out of people to kill. So do, you, so do you believe your show was canceled because of your political views and the, your stance on this topic? Yeah, yeah. And it's that retaliation thing. It's unbelievable to me. If you're not doing what, you know, if you're going to speak out and use this platform, I, I understand this. that happens. I mean, I've seen all kinds of retaliation against people who are trying to disclose atrocities or, or wrongdoings around the world. Well, that's, that's what happens when money gets involved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Our being a capitalist nation, uh, uh, we, we now have a crisis going on in this country whereby the vaunted middle class of America is being whittled down constantly. Mm -hmm. That the yeah. 1% uh, of money making in this country is increasing its share of money and the middle class is being sadly reduced in its share of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely seems to be that way. And I know you're speaking of, you know, people that aren't, well, there's a couple of things I wanted to discuss. So I know you're kind of a, you kind of believe in uh, socialism. I'd heard that on an interview and, you know, I have a Swedish family, so I don't, you know, I actually see the pluses for it myself. So ha how did that come about? Just you, I'm sure back even then, you probably thought that the poor really couldn't even take care of themselves. And I also know that you're involved with or have been involved with hunger projects. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it merely follows that, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying we're the worst, but if we uh, examine what middle classes get in Europe, the Scandinavian societies, France and England, uh, they all take care, better care of their average citizen than we do. Oh, they do. Mm -hmm. I agree. So... Uh, Socialism would be one way to achieve that better care. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure this was an unpopular stance during the time when you were sharing this information or, you know, your desire or your, what's the word, your support for socialism. Yeah, well, I've branded, naturally branded a commie, which I'm not. <laughs> but uh, uh, that, that goes with the game, I guess. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And what hunger, you know, what hunger projects were you involved with? Mm, I wasn't specifically involved. I wasn't involved in any specific uh, project. Uh, Valerie Harper was involved in the hunger project, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, but where, where I've been asked to contribute, I contribute. But that's about all I do. Mm-hmm. I'm not a leader or a, a generator. Mm -hmm. you're, you're so busy doing all your other causes, so I, I can understand. I mean, let's see some of the other things you have going on here. I mean, you have dozens. So I know that health care has been a big issue for you, a hot topic. That's something that you've been discussing as well. Do you want to go into that a little bit? Yeah. Well, I, I just wish we could emulate our northern cousin Canada better mm -hmm. than we do. Uh, they have, I, I suppose you would call it socialized medicine there. Uh, unfortunately, we pay all the uh, expensive doctors here. So uh, though Canada is picking up the bill, you have to wait a long time before you can get treatment in Canada 
and that's the uh, that's the price they pay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that does seem to be the price. They get the treatment. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Uh, single payer uh, is one way of achieving that. How we achieve it, I don't. I don't exactly know what the what the terms and the uh, and the steps are, but uh, I gather single payer uh, health coverage uh, would provide us with universal health care in our country. Mm -hmm. And I understand. I believe it was called California One Care, and. And, and I may be incorrect, because sometimes I think you find online, but you created television advertisements in support of this. I mean, you really put your own money and time yeah. on the line. Yeah. Um, one was jokey, but effective. Um, the, uh, the teachers, I think, were sponsoring that. Uh, California teachers. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I do little things like that wherever I can. Mm-hmm. And then it's I not know the greatest in the world. It's not the greatest what? No, that's okay. uh -huh. It's not the greatest what in the world? I'm not the greatest spokesman in the world, but I, uh, I do what I can. Oh, and then also racism is another topic you've discussed openly, and I know that you were a big supporter of Obama. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? I, uh, I certainly supported Obama. I wasn't a big supporter of him. I didn't give him any money that uh, I could recall. Uh, and he, uh, he had a decent... Um, Tenure as president, mm -hmm. but he made mistakes too. Part of it's just and naivety, I think. I think a lot of his mistakes, he just didn't know the full picture. Well, I, I think he had the wherewithal to, to know the whole picture, but chose not to. Mm -hmm. And it so could have been that, a time uh, too. Immigration, immigration did not thrive under his tutelage. And um, um, the uh, <clears throat> um, torture was not a uh, uh, a banished practice in uh, our apprehension of uh, terrorists mm -hmm. and criminals. Mm -hmm. And there was a particular project about the borders. Like I can't remember exactly what it was. Oh, what was it? Um, I know that the borders were something that was very important to you as well. Trying to create borders without such extreme, you know, uh, measures. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and then we can kind of segue into what's going on now with Trump. I mean, this is horrendous. I think so, since I've heard about what's going on on the borders, I, I you know, being a mother myself, it's, it, it makes me cry, you know, just thinking about it. Um, it it's atrocious. Yeah, it is atrocious. Uh, but at the same time, I, I look at Trump and I, I say, well, uh, he... He is an aberration, but his tenancy, tenancy tends to reveal the underlayer of what America is. It's uh, immigration policies, it's, it's treatment of, the, uh, of uh, its racism, it's... Uh, uh, I mean, the vast majority of people in prison, for instance, are probably there because of marijuana, which is now being recognized by most states as lawful, legal. So uh, we have one of the largest prison populations per capita in uh, in history. So we we. we really need to clean up 
clean up our act. Uh, our racism in this country is abominable and has been. We, uh, we have great apologies to make to the black citizens of our country, those still living. Agreed. Agreed on that, top, on that matter. And then, um, let's see, I know that you were the Entertainment Board of Directors for the Survivor Mitzvah Project. It was a nonprofit organization no. dedicated to providing direct emergency aid to elderly and impoverished Holocaust survivors in Eastern Europe, so that goes back a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was living in Los Angeles, I met Holocaust survivors. They showed me their tattoo on their arms. I don't know how many people are still around, but uh, it was it was right there. It was something tangible to actually meet people who were in the um, concentration camps. Well, certainly I, I've met a number of them, know a few of them. Uh, it's a disappearing breed, and uh, what we have to do those of us who still remain, is uh, never let the memory of them die. Mm -hmm. As they will be dying. Mm -hmm. And there's people out there that don't even believe it really happened, and, and I have such a knee-jerk reaction of anger because I've met people. Uh, I don't know why that is or why they, where this is perpetuated online. It's, kind of, it's one of those things that disgusts me to hear that. Well, because you have uh, Trump supporters, <laughs> you know, I, I think you'll, you know, you, you stare and wonder why these people are are supporting Trump, and uh, you come back with the answer that because America has made so many mistakes. It's racism. It's uh, it's. Uh, anti-immigration uh, attitudes, it's, it's uh, ill-favored Ill eye towards minorities and to, to immigrants, uh, to the poor. We, uh, we don't love our poor. And, and yet there are so many Jesus lovers who don't emulate Jesus to the extent that he did mm -hmm. in his care for the poor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have, um, I, I did see that. I see that as well. There's people that, I mean, there are good Christians, but there are plenty of Christians who do not practice what they preach, and I, I see so much hypocrisy right. within right. their uh, demeanor and their actions. So, and then I understand um, you're a member of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, a free speech organization that is dedicated to protecting comic book creators and retailers from prosecutions based on content. Oh, oh that was a, that was kind of like like an afterthought, but uh, there was a concerted effort towards uh, dumping on the comic book people. Mm, that's interesting. I, I wasn't aware of it. That's why I brought it up. It was I had no idea. Yeah, I, I it's been so long ago. I, I don't remember what the fight was about. <laughs> I guess they were trying to squelch some of the topics that came up. I mean, I had Matt, I was really into comic books, and I know a lot of political, socioeconomic topics actually came up in comic books. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it uh, uh, censorship. Um, I, I think you know our present drive must be to uh, to uh, keep fostering good journalism, maintaining papers where we can, freeing papers up. Uh, not letting Fox News dictate what our subjects of debate are. Especially while uh, the president, the president is trying to, you know, it has major influence, unfortunately, over media choices and decisions. Yeah. Yes. And and because there is so much suspect in America, as there should be, because it's a big monstrous 
over 300 million state. Uh, Trump comes along and talks about fake news here, fake news there. And I would say to you that we have a history of making fake news. I was an opponent of the invasion of Iraq, which was triggered by fake news, news of uh, weapons of mass destruction here, there, everywhere. And we invaded and didn't find those weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, I was saving that. So, I, uh, I definitely wanted to honor you. I know something that's very important to you, and I know you can discuss and I am with you on this, this I was going to lead into the September 11th attacks, and I know we can talk about this for quite a bit. And I know that you signed yes, a statement. And Go ahead. I'm, um, I belong to the uh, um, artists, actors, and engineers, and uh, those people who support the uh, the lies that were generated on 9-11. Uh, the truth has never been told. Even the two heads of the committee appointed to investigate it said that they were denied full information. So uh, we, have, we have official suppression of the news here. And when Donald Trump talks about managed news, fake news, uh, we have examples of what he says. So the people join him on those grounds, and then they, they buy the rest of his garbage. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we've got to learn to distinguish between his fake news and our fake news, or what is genuine fake news. It's a problem. A huge one at that. And I know you signed a statement released by the organization 9-11 Truth in 2004 that calls for a new, you're demanding a new investigation on the September 11th attacks. And, and again, I've been in contact with so many people involved with this particular uh, movement. Yeah. Well, uh, we have, uh, I also am, am uh, was chosen to be on the committee of uh, lawyers uh, for 9-11 Truth and uh, uh, the committee has chosen to petition uh, for a grand jury in New York to investigate the problem and presenting it in a most dignified <coughs> and worthwhile way concerning the legal aspects that have been uh, overridden or overlooked. So we're still waiting to hear what uh, decision has been made on that. And to backtrack just a little bit, when you saw the events of 9-11, what warning bells went off in your head that kind of indicated to you that something wasn't right? It just smelled from the very outset, smelled, you felt the phoniness. And then after the fact, when you, when you hear of the enormous uh, testimony of hearing explosions throughout the building, of the fact that, you know, just the very fact that uh, no, no high rise has ever burnt down, as has been claimed with these uh, buildings. Most people don't know about Building Seven, a 47-story tall building, 100 yards from either of the twin towers, which was also brought down into its own uh, footprint. Um, the, I, I can keep citing facts at you, throw facts at you. The, the fact that it takes a certain amount of heat to destroy a building the way 
those buildings were destroyed. That heat was never generated by planes flying into their upper stories. Yeah, I remember hearing that too, that there's no way, I, I may be really wrong about the temperatures, like it needs to be like 3,000 degrees in order to melt it, and it was, it was absolutely... 2,500, 2, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the, the, yeah. the, top, the top temperature by such an explosion of planes flying into it and setting the furnishings on fire, uh, like five, six hundred degrees is all that's possible. And the fact that thermite and neothermate, which is designed to, in, in conjunction with sulfur, to burn things at a higher degree than normal, than they would normally burn, which is why you found steel, steel still smoldering in the ground 10 days after the event. Uh, that steel that was shipped to China or Japan, I believe. Um, which was really strange because it was not, you would think on such a massive, um, a massive event that they would do a thorough investigation, but instead they just cleaned it all up and all of a sudden it was gone. I thought that oh. was very, that's one of the warning bells that didn't make sense to me. That's what went off in my head and I'm like, why would they do that? Don't they need this material to investigate properly? They, um... They're not eager to know the truth, let's put it that way. Yeah. And the other thing that, you know, my father was an engineer, and most of my family, Swedes have a lot of engineers, they said that, you know, it was an asymmetric hit, but it went down symmetrically, evenly, perfectly oh. evenly. Yeah. yeah. The building straightened itself out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that 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 building was built, you know, my cousin of the engineer um, that I'm talking, my uncle, um, because my cousin, he just decided to take the day off and go surfing. There were great waves that day, so he happened to not be in the building that day, thank God. But my uncle took special interest in this in the in the structure in the building of the structure um, and he just there's so many points he made to me that were of alarm and concerning to him that did not make sense sense especially how well that building was put together it was supposed to withstand yeah. earthquakes it was built to protect itself from terrorism acts well mm -hmm. uh, well the, the the frightening thing is that the vast majority of people, no matter how educated, don't want to hear about it. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I gave up uh, after a few years of trying to convince people mm -hmm. on the, uh, the facts as I knew them. And uh, they um, they would look at me with Google eyes <laughs> and uh, signifying I, w I had lost my senses. So that um, I finally gave up. Mm -hmm. I don't think people are willing to listen to reason. In this Isn't that ironic? Case. People thought you lost your marbles, but it, isn't that ironic that people thought you lost your marbles? Meanwhile, they're completely not, there's the critical thinking aspect is gone from people who can't take the time to analyze this information. Well, I, I attribute it to one of two things. One, they, they can't believe that sainted Mother America could allow such a thing to happen here. I mean, we, we, can, we can accept the barbarity of, of treating black people like slaves for hundreds of years, but uh, uh, ignore that. Yeah. So that America, uh, America would not uh, allow 3,000 of its citizens to be butchered in such a way with... Mm -hmm. uh, 
with government uh, uh, tolerance of such an act taking place. So that's that's one thing. Then there's the other. Uh, you know, in other words, uh, uh, you can't tell them there's no Santa Claus. <laughs> right. And the and the other aspect is those people who. Uh, uh, know that they could find the fact convincing, but they don't want to get hooked on the dilemma and end up being called a conspirator. A word created by the government to kind of discredit anybody who questions, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm, I agree. It's just it, it has this negative connotation, and that was planned that was orchestrated by the government so people can go under that umbrella and be looked at as crazies if anybody spoke out well it's just hard to imagine well, why aren't uh, why aren't uh, isn't anybody talking uh, but not, uh, even if they did talk they wouldn't be published mm -hmm. uh, or they would be ignored. It uh, is a conspiracy of silence as to what can be discussed in our country, what is tolerable and what isn't. And that's one of them, I guess. Mm -hmm. And to get back to that, because the 9-11 is something that haunts me to this day, the, the events of 9-11, like, it's like this cognitive dissonance, like there's two different ideas and they don't line up, but, you know, dissonance can be reduced by finding scientific explanation, which there's plenty of, and, you know, one of the people that, the, the reason why I found you is because of Charles Ewing Smith, do you, do you know him, do you, he made this incredible, was part of this incredible documentary on 9-11. Ah, uh, what's the name of that documentary? You know, that's what I can't exactly remember. He did two. Uh, just look up, if people are on and they're listening, look up Charles Ewing Smith, 9-11 documentary. Oh, hey. That's what I'm trying to remember. Um, he, I, his most recent one was from a psychologist's perspective. Let me look it up. It was fresh in my head. Hold on. Sometimes I think I have too much information. It's hard to retain any of it. Let's see. Looking it up here, but he's just a wonderful man. He uh, does the sound for many, many uh, movies and Oscar award winning movies. Let's see. Just a wonderful person. Uh huh. Let's see here. So the name of it, The Demolition of Truth. Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And then he did, like, as I mentioned, he did an, another one just recently about the psychologist uh, point of view. And, um, and they went into, like, how the lobby collapsed and there was three explosions after that. I mean, I kind of remember some of the topics we discussed and how, you know, and, but both of them cover how the, uh, that what happened violates the laws of physics. And then they were talking about, in the, in the most recent one, I remember, you know, they were analyzing the mindset of America after this event and, you know, when they talked about the controlled demolition and that it was a false flag. And so they kind of went into how, if in fact, that what we're alleging is true, how we were all manipulated to, you know, to everyone, that the entire world was affected by this event and saddened. It was a horrific event and just everybody in the world had been moved or touched on some level. So that really backed up this fervor to go into the Middle East and, you know, possibly this war was based on that as a reaction to what yeah. happened, a terroristic event. So There um, was that. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that this, um, um, uh, the Bush administration had came in with a, a strong drive to change a lot of things. And they did. And uh, the, com the country was humming there for a while. Mm -hmm. And then this, this program of change finally ran out of changes to make. And the economy began to slow down. 9-11 took place at a time of this slowdown 
and it uh, was very fortuitous that 9-11 happened because it was the urgency, the emergency to uh, give the Bush administration a renewed sense of purpose. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I tend to think that he was not necessarily implicated, but I certainly think Cheney was. Mm-hmm. And I know Rumsfeld comes into the topic of, topic of conversation as well. And, yeah. and, and it's not yeah. to say that Bush even was aware of what we believe, uh, you and I personally. It's you know, because he has advisors and, you know, someone knows down the, you know, chain of command and these, you know, dark black operations and, you know, because there's the overt part of the government and there is a huge uh, covert part of the government, uh, this military industrial complex. And so, I mean, they have, you know, trillions of amounts of money, you know, trillions of dollars. So, but it just seemed to me that in one of the discussions on some of the documentaries I watched, they were talking about that America the goal was to acquire or, or to be involved with, uh, to acquire seven countries in seven years to destabilize to destabilize the Middle East. Uh uh-huh. Yeah, to be in seven countries, I should say, and uh, yeah, it you know a policy. We're still involved in war there, aren't we? Ha, ha, yeah, ha. imagine that. Mm-hmm. I don't know how long this fight in the Middle East is going to go on. It just seems. You know, I don't see the solution anytime soon. It would be ideal. It's a heartbreaking once you're once you kind of focus on the Middle East and what's going on. It's heartbreaking. It really is. Well, nobody um, nobody harkens back to Eisenhower. Beware the military-industrial complex. And we have not been beware enough, have we? Mm-hmm. So Eisenhower. Will you embellish on that a little bit or go into that a little further? Because, it's, again, it's before my time. So One of his last statements in office. Uh-huh. Our country to beware of the military-industrial complex. Ah. Regarded as a surprising statement coming from a general. Mm-hmm. But it certainly has come to pass, wouldn't you say? I would say so. What a noble person. And his wife, I I just respect and admire her so much. I just, I know more about his wife than him. So I think uh, I should do a little, go back and do a little more history because so many things were kind of indicated or hinted about what came, what is coming about now is, is common knowledge, or I should say is emerging common knowledge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> Who's your favorite president? You've had a nice long life. You've seen a lot of presidents and position of, you know, uh, presidencies. So I'm just curious who your favorite president was. It can be before you were born, of course. I'd have to say Roosevelt. Yeah, I imagine. Just look into him. He just sounds like a really wonderful man. Um, and then the Kennedy events, what were your thoughts on that? Because that's kind of covering on, you know, we're talking about truth and truth movements and truthers. What did you think about the Kennedy events? About what? Uh, John Kennedy in the assassination? Oh. Well, I know that there's a book out called JFK and the Unspeakable. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was quite a successful book. This is another example. Mm-hmm. There's a whole chapter in that book, well researched, etc., in which he the author stoutly claims that the FBI, the CIA, and the Secret Service, or members thereof, were involved in the assassination of John Kennedy. Yeah, that's I hear that quite a bit in my circles. What's that? I've heard that plenty in my circles. No. Plenty of times, you know, and uh, a lot of people that I know that are, uh, you know, older than me, I should say, um, I've been very fortunate to 
to interview the top whistleblowers of all time, uh, and I've been, it's been such a wonderful experience for me. And a lot of them tell me, like when they were growing up, what occurred in JFK with JFK is kind of what made them realize that something's not right with uh, our government and it started making them ask questions. And it was, you know, a lot of times in the 60s too is when people really started to open their minds and had the freedom yeah. and liberty to start asking questions instead of just going along with everybody. And you have this mass, you know, like the 50s was this kind of place where you didn't ask questions and everyone was doing what everyone else did. And it, on the surface, it seemed like such an ideal existence. But racism, of course, we know was something that, you know, that was not an existence that I, I, that part of the 50s is something that obviously needed to change. Well, um, look, look at the low status labor is uh, found at, at. Hello? Yes. Labor is found out at this point of time. Um, I, I must be another call. Um, I hate to ask you this, but do you know how much longer you, you need me? We have like eight more minutes. Let me just see who this call is. Sure, Mr. Asner, no problem. So anyways, we're here with Mr. As Ed Asner. He is I'm with you. Oh, you're with me. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. You're just reading the caller ID. So, okay, so we'll fast forward to now. What kind of projects are you working on in the future? Do you have anything planned? What do you think about the time we're living in? I mean, I know Trump um, is kind of a sore. So I'm just curious, what has happened that you do appreciate? What good has come out of activism that you've seen in your wonderful long lifetime? <laughs> Wonderfully long, I should say. You're making me scratch my head. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm 88 years old. Oh, uh, there's that phone again. Let me just take a moment and find out who this is. Sure. Be right there. Okay. What a full life. 88 years. I'm like half that. <laughs> I hope I live 88 years. And I hope in uh, 44 more years that the world would, it will have changed. It's time to have a change. I think people are waking up. I don't see the actual changes, but people are definitely becoming more aware. People are questioning. Hello? Oh, go ahead, sir. Um. So we were talking about the changes you've seen in your wonderfully long life and and the, maybe the hope you have. What do you see? What do you foresee? If maybe things have not changed. I know it's taking place in little ways. Uh, um, the final apprehend. I mean, the Me Too movement, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, I'm, uh, I think they made mistakes, such as such as uh, Al. Um, a comedian senator from uh, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, mm -hmm. Al Franken. Mm -hmm. I think that was uh, poor taste on the Me Too movement. But in, in the rest of it, um, depredators have been hauled in. Harvey Weinstein. Were you aware of his reputation prior to? No, wasn't. No. I wasn't either, and everyone says, you know, I was living in Los Angeles, and I was pretty connected to a lot of people down there. I was not aware. I knew I just loved their movies. I, they were so artistic and wonderful. Right, right. Wonderful actors. Yeah. I had, I regarded, I regarded him as like a hero in Hollywood, making quality films, interesting films. So it, I had no idea. Well, there's, there's him. There's Cosby. Mm -hmm. A depredator of, if he's found guilty. 
Heart, that's heartbreaking shorter. for me because you know being the age I am I loved him and he was African American and he was on television when I was a child and I my mother oh. being from Sweden and her thinking finding that America was racist in certain pockets she just loved the fact that you know that he had his own show and and I was on Saturdays I would watch it and so it's just that that was that revelation was heartbreaking to me on a personal level and now Morgan Freeman. That's another one. Oh, another person that uh -huh. I just adored. And so many of us do. Yeah. Wonderful, seemingly well, wonderful man. He hasn't been tried and convicted yet. So we'll see what happens. I hope I hope it's disproved. Mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes... You, uh, you know, this is a touchy topic because, you know, sometimes it's just a man flirting with a woman. So it's such a fine line. And, you know, but I guess when it becomes abusive or unwanted or, um, you know, but sometimes if a man, you know, flirts with you a little bit, I don't know um, if that's, you know, I don't think that's harassment. I think it's just sometimes harmless. I guess you could say we're still fighting the battle of the sexes, aren't we? Yeah, it seems to be so, you know. That's one thing Except you could that, you've um, seen. Hey, the playing is, field is being brought to be more even than it has been in the past. You know, and I see people like people in leadership roles that are African American, Latino, and so that's something that's I, I've seen in my life. And then also yeah. something you would have seen: women couldn't even vote. They, I don't even think they could wear pants. You know, yeah. there was the suffrage movement, and you know, I, I I like to knit, and I have a lot of senior friends, and we knit little circles and stuff. Someone knows, <laughs> it doesn't seem like my personality, but I like it. It's very calming, and they tell me all kinds of stories. Some of these women are ninety. One woman's ninety-eight years old, and she. I just oh. admit, fascinating stories. How far we've come as women. Sure. Sure. Uh, so that's something that's on the positive side. And uh, so rectification has to take place in, in the history of our little planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was feeling very positive about the environment, the environmental movements, and then, you know, the person that was put in charge of the EPA, that, uh -huh. that part was really hard for me to stomach. And then, you know, I had people involved with, um, oh, my goodness, I'm, my... Uh, Oh, I can't believe I'm forgetting the movement or that was that blocked the pipelines being put in. I had my first space yeah. about that. Anyways, and then as soon as Trump took office, he went and let, put him in there anyways. So um, you know, so that part was hard to understand, hard for me to stomach. And last week I had oh. a guy that um, from the um, rainforest fund. He was really wonderful, and he talked about just how important it is to keep those rainforests alive and protected. Well, frankly, I'm. Uh... Yeah. I call myself a Gaiist now, who believes in the uh, the uh, existence of the earth, and that's all I care about. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't care about man. I don't care about uh, um, human Maybe beings. So. Yeah. Guys, I care about the, the beauty of the earth and the creatures that inhabit it. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way I do. I do see a lot of hope, you know, because of the nature of my work. Uh, Mr. Astor, I've just met and had conversations with such wonderful people like yourselves. People have really tried to wow. give a 100% effort, have done whatever they can, whatever they can to bring attention to atrocities, to issues, to... Um, projects that could make a big difference and I'm hoping that all this work that people put in will eventually you know be uh, upheld I hope that they make real changes down the road you know sometimes it just takes awareness I think the initial stage is awareness or well, perhaps uh, just getting rid of man <laughs> let the earth recover <laughs> you yeah right? yeah Give it a breathing spell. Right. I know we have a beautiful world, and you know she doesn't disagree with us. She doesn't have political Listen views, and she just needs to be taken care of. She gives us everything. And she does. She well, guy is female, so I know. I know. Yeah. I know. They sure does. I'm probably willing to live we'll under fight. that female. No. We will run. And we will live. Uh -oh. 
I think we're in the commercial. Shame on you. This could be the greatest night of our lives. Flash but you're going to let it through.